now speaking about changes in avian diversity and abundance at the Salton Sea. Um, our moderator today is Andrea Jones. She's the Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon, California. And over the past 15 years has led conservation programs and worked with staff at uh, numerous Audubon chapters across the state of California and previously worked in Massachusetts. Andrea, take it away. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us today. It's uh, good to see a great crowd here today. Um, I'm gonna in introduce each speaker. Each speaker will speak for approximately 10 minutes, which will leave us plenty of time at the end for questions. Uh, you can either hold your questions to the end and raise your hand at the end, or um, as you go, if you have questions, put them in chat. If I can answer them as we go, I will do that, or I will save them to the end for the panelists to answer your questions. And uh, with that, I will pass it over to Blake Barbary. Um, Blake is senior water bird ecologist at Point Blue Conservation Science. Uh, he received his master's in wildlife science from Oregon State University, and he joined Point Blue in 2012 to advance conservation of migratory shorebirds across California and the Pacific Flyway. And when he's not crunching numbers and analyzing data, he's out in the fields in the Central Valley capturing shorebirds. So both in the field and doing a lot of great science work. Um, welcome, Blake. Great, thanks so much, Andrea. I'm going to run sharing my screen here and make sure we get everything looking correct. Let's check this. Okay, and can we confirm that you can see now just the picture of the Salton Sea um, and migratory shorebirds of the Pacific Flyway? Um, so yeah, thanks for that that introduction, Andrea. I'm really excited to to be here and have the opportunity to talk about uh, really the importance of the Salton Sea from the perspective of a migratory shorebird and thinking about it from a few different perspectives, from really zoomed out and then all the way down to the really just an individual site and to see and how much that's been changing over the years. <clears throat> but first, we really need to start and think about this by taking a step way back, taking a step way back. And I think about this from the perspective of a migratory shorebird that's using potentially the entire Western hemisphere, if not the entire continent of North America throughout their annual life cycle. And we take this far step back and, and look at this entire vast landscape. We know that the far Northern portion of of the continent and particularly the western portion of the continent is not accessible for a vast majority of the year and win in winter in particular, but in summertime there's a, an abundance of prey resources and habitat resources open up for these for these birds. So that area is only available for them for a portion of the year. When we look at the far southern portion of the continent and in South America, you know there's a lot less habitat overall for the birds. It's a tropical region where the, the prey resources are relatively stable, but not in the extreme abundance that they necessarily need to breed. So that whole area is most, uh, an extremely important wintering area and primarily wintering zone. But then in the middle, we have this sweet spot that is, has many areas that are temperate enough to have the food resources available for these birds throughout the winter. But then it's also in between these other areas. So it's an extremely important site for birds during migration as well. So this region holds extreme, uh, this such high importance for migratory shorebirds because it falls in this sweet spot as being a really great wintering area and then also great for stopovers during migration. So we zoom in a little bit to this area and there's a few things that really stand out when you're in space. And one of those is the Salton Sea. It's the biggest lake in California. It's one of the biggest lakes in all of Western North America. And it really, and once it was created, really attracted the attention of migratory shorebirds that were traveling across this entire flyway. Most of them are traveling north to south. And in particular, if these birds are on, on their way north, they're traveling primarily along the coast. Interior portions of Latin America and Mexico are pretty mountainous and not a lot of wetland and emergent habitats for most of the shorebird species. So they're really traveling north along the coastal areas. And in particular, those birds traveling north along the, in the inland portion of Western North America and up the, the Gulf of Mexico, or sorry, the Gulf of California, 
they are really heading directly towards the Salton Sea. It's a bottleneck on the landscape that is bringing them to the Salton Sea. And then it's also this nexus to where birds have the options of heading either more towards the coast. So species that are more coastal migrants are able to use the Salton Sea and then jump over to the coast or potentially head up the Central Valley. But also a lot of the species that are really planning to head through these more interior arid regions of the Intermountain West, the Salton Sea is also a potential, a potentially important stopover site for those birds and those species as well. So to understand really the importance of, of the Salton Sea in the greater context of the flyway, we want to look at some numbers, right? There's, there's really very little data overall at the scale large enough to understand the relative importance of the Salton Sea within the, within the flyway. But the first and only real major, major survey of the flyway that occurred um, historically was back in 1989 through 1995, which was called the Pacific Flyway Project, which was led by our organization, then Point, uh, Point Reyes Bird Observatory. And what they attempted to do was really the first widespread survey to understand what is just the relative importance of all of these different sites in the flyaway to shorebirds. So there was many surveys on the coast. And there was also a whole huge portion of the Intermountain West region, which is what you see on the, on the screen on the left, which included the Salton Sea. And so these are these interior sites being a little different than many of the coastal sites um, that were surveyed. And what they did was during spring and fall migration, they surveyed 180 sites throughout this large portion of the Intermountain West for at least three to five years during spring and fall migration and targeting migration because we know when this is when there's the highest abundance and the highest diversity of shorebirds um, within this region. And at the Salton Sea in particular, what they did was try to create a, a comprehensive survey of the entire sea. So this created around 19 segments covering the entire perimeter of the shoreline and then also surveyed targeted surveys of more flooded agricultural fields and ponds and some smaller wetlands that occurred throughout the Imperial Valley to get really a comprehensive look at shoreward populations within the greater Salton Sea ecosystem. <clears throat> and what they found was the Salton Sea was extremely important for shorebirds in the Pacific Flyway. And this was 30 years ago, but these numbers likely are still similar today in the relative importance and that really the Salton Sea and the Great Salt Lake are by far the most important regions, or sorry, the most important sites for migratory shorebirds um, within this interior portion of the flyway. And they found that in fall, only the Great Salt Lake had more shorebirds on average than the Salton Sea. And the Great Salt Lake is really known as this massive staging area in fall where many, many shorebirds are going to molt their flight feathers, which is an annual thing that occurs for these birds each fall. Um, but then in the spring, the Salton Sea had on average, the highest number of shorebirds of any of these interior sites from across the entire Inner Mountain West. And that really feeds into um, the, the notion that I mentioned a moment ago, and these birds are traveling north, large portions of their populations are having the option to stop over in the sea, at the sea, and many of them are, are, are just doing just that. So now today we have a, a large network of monitoring sites for shorebirds called the, the Migratory Shorebird Project. This shorebird monitoring network now has sites across all 13 countries of the Pacific coast of the Americas, including well over 50 partner organizations and counting well over a million shorebirds each winter. And to do that and pull off surveys of this vast scale is requiring huge network of volunteer community scientists and then also partner biologists. And, and Salton Sea, this survey is occurring in November and winter as part of the Pacific Flyway Shorebird Survey, which is the, the US portion of the larger migratory shorebird project. These surveys began in 2012, and again, are really dependent on partnerships. So everyone you're gonna hear from today has um, helped contribute to an annual survey in winter as part of this flyway network of monitoring for shorebirds. And so what we found was the first four years with the help of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the LA uh, Museum of Natural History and some other folks were able to comprehensively survey the shoreline of the Salton Sea for four consecutive years from 2012 to 2015. And you see they were able to cover on each, each year over 100 um, square kilometers of area along, primarily along the shoreline of the sea. So a, a comprehensive survey of the shoreline. But then in 2016 was the first year 
that the, that the sea had receded far enough that they were no longer able to get boats into the actual water to, to conduct the survey. So no surveys occurred in 2016 and 17 as we dealt with the fact that boat surveys were no longer possible. So covering large areas with the boat um, no longer possible. We had to think and redesign some of our shore, uh, some, of, some of our shoreline segments to then be more easily broken up to survey on foot and also integrate with some of the work that Audubon and Bob and the state is, is doing as well. So over the last four winters, we've gotten out each winter on foot and in ATVs and covered larger, large portions of the shoreline, but about 35-ish percent of the full comprehensive survey over the past four years. You will, we've hit some many challenges trying to pull off surveys on the ground in the winter um, at, this, at this scale across the whole sea. As you see in 2019, the amount of area that we were able to survey was considerably less than half of the other three years because we hit logistical challenges and some rain just before the survey. Definitely one of those, one of those pictures from the right is 2019. So we didn't even, weren't able to even get ATVs out that year. So the last few years, we've learned a lot of hard lessons trying to access the shoreline, but we have also been able to collect um, quite a bit of data from large portions of the shoreline. And what we found when you see this graph, which is just simply the total number of shorebirds that have been counted during all eight of these annual surveys, we see that overall, the, in the four more recent years, the, the average number of birds total was somewhat similar to the, the first four years that had a comprehensive survey, but we know we have not covered as much area in the last four years. So when we correct those numbers for the amount of area that we've actually covered, there is evidence of potentially increased abundance of shorebirds um, across the sea from the first four years of these surveys to the more four recent years. Now, again, these are preliminary results. We have not done any formal analyses to make any conclusions about an increase in abundance, but we, there is potentially a signal from our results in midwinter that shorebird populations have potentially increased um, just over the sc scale of the last 10 years. And as next steps, we're really curious, is this a true signal of an increase or were we just potentially surveying some of the areas within the sea that had more, shore, more shorebirds than others. So we really need to recreate these more comprehensive surveys before we can draw any conclusions about uh, um, any potential increase. Um, but really, we at this point, we would predict an increase in importance for shorebirds based on the different um, changes that are occurring at the sea. We know as the sea is receding, there's a diversity of shallow water habitats opening up for these birds and areas where the sea was shallow already, there's expanses of shallow water. We also know as the sea disconnects from many of the drains, the drains are then pud puddling up and ponding up and creating emergent wetlands for these birds. We also know wind events pushes the, pushes the water across the playa and then pulls back and just leaves puddles. So it's this, the sea receding is potentially creating a, a diversity of habitat for migratory shorebirds. We also know that um, there's, potentially increased in, um, abundance of their prey and the invertebrates as the loss of fish within the food web, it's really having repercussions. We're likely seeing increases in the amount of invertebrates available. So that also could be potentially playing into any changes in overall shorebird abundance. And we just know generally where this location is on the landscape. If there's any increase in extent or quality of habitat for shorebirds, they're gonna find it. It's in a spot that many of these birds are going to pass over. Um, it, once if not twice during their annual cycle. Um, Blake, just a time check. We're gonna to need to move to the next talker pretty soon, thanks. Good, yes, um, this is the last slide I had really, um, but in looking forward, so we're gonna be, we're looking for support to, re to recreate these comprehensive surveys to not only in the winter to give us this look at 10 years, uh, mm -hmm. retrospective look at 10 years back, but then also redoing the surveys from spring and fall and create and creating these comprehensive surveys to give us a, a look back at changes over the past 30 years. So that's our goal over the next three to five years is to recreate those surveys. And we'll certainly be looking for volunteers to help with those surveys. So please do reach out if, um, if you're interested in helping. And just as a last thank you to, to everyone who's contributed to these surveys, most of the folks you'll hear from today, as I mentioned, have 
help out um, in contributing to this network. And it takes an army to pull off surveys at this scale. So I just want to say thank you to all the partners. And then just thanks for the opportunity to, to speak to you all today. Thank you, Blake. And I see questions coming up and we'll hold those to the end to make sure everyone has a chance to give their presentations. But thank you for your incoming questions. Um, next up is Camila Bautista, and she is a Salt and Sea Program Coordinator for Audubon, California. She was born and raised in the Coachella Valley, has a bachelor's degree in biology, and is currently working on her master's degree in hydrology, which she is doing at a restoration site at the Salton Sea. For Audubon, she helps manage our Bombay Beach Wetland Restoration Project, and she also spends time assisting Audubon scientists with our bird surveys and water sampling collection. Thank you, Camila. Thank you, Andrea, for that introduction. Uh, just checking, can everybody see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Got it. Uh, so yeah, hi everybody. My name is Camila Bautista and I'm the project coordinator with Audubon California for the Salton Sea program. Um, our program generally focuses on addressing some of the immense challenges of the Salton Sea through habitat mapping, monitoring and analysis, uh, through community engagement, as well as through policy. And our ultimate goal is, you know, to advocate for a, for a sustainable Salton Sea that can provide uh, robust and diverse habitats for birds, as well as to control dust um, to protect the human health for more than half a million people that live near the Salton Sea. Um, our program is led by Frank Ruiz, who is the program director. Uh, we also have Mike Lyons, who is a director of policy, and Andrea Jones, who is a director of bird conservation. Um, so the Salton Sea is important for many reasons, um, but when we're specifically, you know, talking about birds, the sea is one of the most uh, critical bird habitats along the Pacific Flyway. Um, the Pacific Flyway can be defined as a major north-south um, route for migratory birds who travel, you know, some or all of this distance. They do this in the spring um, and in the fall, and they would do this to follow food sources. Um, they're heading to breeding grounds or they're making their way to their wintering sites. Um, and in the Pacific Flyway route, there's only 10 remaining wetland sites, and one of these is the Salton Sea. Um, so the sea is providing this habitat for birds. It's serving as a major nesting and wintering and stopover site uh, for millions of birds from more than 400 species. Um, and it's been serving this purpose for over a century now. And as many of us know, um, the sea is in danger of losing its ecological value. You know, as the water levels are continuing to recede and salinity levels in the water are increasing, this is posing a huge threat to not only the birds, but to the people who call the sea home. Uh, so without the sea, um, where would these birds go? You know, um, some species may become endangered or they'll face extinction and public health risks would definitely increase. Uh, so in 2016, Audubon partnered with Point Blue um, to work on the habitat suitability model, which is essentially this report that uses bird surveys and remote sensing uh, to, to quantify how much habitat was being used by birds at the Salton Sea and also to find out what habitats these were. Um, so through this report, we found that birds were using almost 58,000 acres of habitat in both 1999 and in 2015. And five of these key habitat types um, that are being used by the birds are playa, mudflats and shallow water, mid-depth water, deep water, and permanent and vegetated wetlands. Um, ultimately, this is useful to create a baseline uh, to know how much habitat is available and how much habitat we should advocate for uh, the state to protect going forward and what the breakdown of these habitats were. And here's just a visualization of what that looks like. So this is uh, playa habitats. This is mudflats and shallow waters. Um, we have deeper waters here. And then we have permanent vegetated wetlands and mid-depth water. So of these, of these habitat types, um, four of them are being used by birds at the sea that are also important in mitigating dust, which is all of these except playa. Um, and this is important to note because creating or maintaining these types of habitats at the sea can ultimately help with dust control um, to alleviate the public health threat that this dust pollution causes, again, for more than half a million community members. So following that habitat suitability model, Audubon launched the Salt and Sea Bird Survey Program to create a standardized bird survey protocol. And this has been ongoing since 2016. Uh, these bird surveys have been made possible by our ornithologist, Andrea Jones, Daniel Cooper, and Luke Tiller. And we've also had help from our geospatial analyst, Daniel Orr, and our program director, Frank Reese. Um, so we wanted to begin conducting bird surveys at the Salton Sea. At the same time, though, we did become interested in um, understanding these changes in bird populations as the Salton Sea's environment was changing. 
uh, essentially because we know that water levels were decreasing and ultimately salinity is going to increase as well and this would both influence bird counts um so this is uh, showing some data from the bureau of reclamation and the united states geological survey and the measured salinity is shown here in this red trend line and then we can see the water level decreasing in this blue line um and these changes in the water level and salinity can ultimately impact the ecosystem by changing the types of available habitats and food sources for birds uh, so we wanted to be able to track these changes so for our water bird surveys, uh, we essentially chose um, four different, 14 different sites around the Salton Sea, and these are indicated by these uh, red dots around this map. Um, and we basically chose these areas because we found them to be, um, you know, representative, but also the most accessible. And this is important because um, we do include a lot of volunteers out on our bird surveys, so it's important that they can also be able to make it out to these areas. Um, but our, our basic methods for these surveys included going to each of these sites, picking a spot and we would survey out towards the sea in about like a kilometer squared box area. And we would do this about like 20 minutes at each site. And we were we began doing these surveys um, every other month at first. And then we switched to doing these surveys every month for about two years. And then we are currently doing them quarterly. So about every three months. And we found that doing this is still effective to get statistically significant count results. And then just some of our initial results show that there was about 65 total species of water birds. And then the top four most abundant were the California and the ring-billed gull, the ready duck, the northern shoveler, and the western and least sandpiper. So part of our salt and sea monitoring program, um, like I mentioned earlier, involves engaging the community, uh, which also includes high school students. And we call it the Eyes on the Sea program. So pictured here are students from Indio High School, which is a local high school here. Um, they helped and they learned about water quality parameters. Uh, they learned about birds and bird surveys. They learned about invertebrate surveys and topics related to environmental justice and salt and sea policy. Um, we were able to use the students' help and pair that with our own bird survey results. Uh, so with our bird survey program, um, one of the main questions that we wanted to ask is if there was a shift in functional groups of birds. Um, and this is an important question to ask because uh, this graphic here shows uh, the total number of birds counted over a survey period from 2016 to 2021. And um, just generally looking at this, you can see that um, it stays relatively consistent, like the count stays consistent, but there is a general trend for fluctuation, um, where there's more birds during the spring and the fall migration periods, um, and in the winters as well, but we would see less in the late springs and the early summers, which is expected. Um, so then we would ask ourselves, you know, what exactly is changing if the bird numbers are consistent? Um, so for just a quick definition, a functional group of birds would be like a, a, a bird species that perform the same role in an ecosystem. So for example, like birds that all eat the same way, like fish eating birds um, would be a functional group. And similarly, um, birds lower on the food level, like shorebirds would be a functional group as well. So based on our observations at this point, uh, we hypothesized that there were fewer fish eating birds and there were more birds feeding lower on the food chain. Um, and we thought that this would be happening again because uh, the environment's changing. Uh, so, so to answer that functional group shift question, uh, we did eventually find that there was in fact a statistically significant result that showed a decrease in fishing birds. And here are just some box plots that show the distribution of bird counts um, for the eared grebe, the white pelican, and the double-crested cormorant. And for the pelican and the cormorant, you can see um, from when we began the survey up to year three and moving forward from that, their numbers, you know, basically became zero. Um, but the eared grebe is a little different because the numbers almost dropped during year two, um, but they began to come back in 2018, which would be year three, and they have consistently gone up since. Um, and this is likely because the eared grebe does not just like eat fish, um, but they also eat other things like invertebrates. And just to uh, elaborate on that a little bit, um, eared grebes have been feeding on water boatman bugs. Um, and this might be due to a decrease in the bugs main predator, which were fish. So if there's less fish, then this likely has allowed water boatman bugs to, to multiply. Um, so in this figure, it's taken from the Oasis Bird Observatory. It does show that they ran some aerial surveys um, and they found a count of almost half a million eared grebes uh, in 2020, which is you know still a smaller count than what they used to be in about the 90s, which is about 3 million of them. But this is still good news to see that they were almost zero in uh, 2017 and they're coming back. 
And the same trend um, that we found with the decline in fish eating birds is corroborated by longer term trends from the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So they've done studies since 2008 up until 2018. Um, and they did this on the white pelican, which is represented in this blue color, in the brown pelican represented in the orange, and in, with the double crested cormorant with this gray color here. Um, and so you can see throughout the years, all of, all of these three species have declined to almost nothing. So then on the opposite end, we do have um, birds that are feeding lower on the food chain. And with these, we did find that they are increasing. And these birds are eating um, like invertebrates, like um, water bowman bugs, they're eating algae and potentially biofilm. Um, and so this is just a box plot for the least Western sandpiper. And you can see that over time, they are, their counts are increasing. But this box plot would look similar for birds like the American avocet, as well as the ruddy duck and the northern shoveler. Uh, so in summary, uh, here are just some of the results that we found for our five-year uh, bird survey monitoring and related studies. Uh, so related to water, we did find that um, using Bureau of Reclamation data, that salinity has increased uh, by 66% from 2004 to 2020. Um, making it two times saltier than the ocean. And through our own Audubon water parameter surveys, we also found this increase. Um, and we did find that the dissolved oxygen is declining, which is gonna affect um, invertebrates and fish. Um, and then related to species results, uh, we did find that over 90% of invertebrate samples are water boatman bugs. And as a result, uh, we're seeing birds like the eared grebes come back. Um, but this is still like a cause for concern because there's a lack in invertebrate diversity, um, which can put their population at risk if the salinity continues to increase and the dissolved oxygen decreases. And then as far as our total, our total numbers go, again, they have not necessarily been declining, but we have been seeing a shift in species composition. Um, so we're seeing a decline in fishing birds, but at the same time, an, in, an increase in birds that eat lower on the trophic level. Um, and just to add to this point, the reason that diversity hasn't necessarily changed statistically is because it's really only a handful of birds that really have completely left, um, like the white and brown pelican and the cormorant, versus most of the birds that are still at the sea, like the shovelers, the gulls, and shorebirds are still eating a wider array of, of things. Um, but the take home message here is essentially that uh, there's still a lot of wetland habitat at the sea, um, and it's still continuing to provide really good habitat. So as the sea is continuing to recede, it's gonna become really important for the state to figure out how to conserve the wetland habitat uh, going forward in places like Bombay Beach. And I'll show you a photo of that right now. Um, but it's important to uh, restore these areas to ensure higher quality habitat for these water birds. Um, so this figure here is just taken from a report we did in 2020 um, that focused on using remote sensing to identify newly uh, emerging vegetation on exposed playa. And this is basically, you know, newly emerging wetland shown in this green polygon. And it came out to about 6,000 acres of wetlands around the Salton Sea. And this is what it would look like if you were on the ground. This is an image of the Bombay Beach wetland, which would be here. Um, and ultimately, again, these habitats are very important for bird species that, are, that we continue to monitor. And these habitats can serve as areas that the state can implement, you know, both habitat restoration projects, as well as dust control projects for public health mitigation moving forward. And that's the end of my presentation. Great, thank you so much, Camila. That was fantastic. Um, I've been answering some of the questions that you've gotten as we've been going here. Um, so we'll move on to Bob McKernan and again, save other questions for the end. Um, and thank you, Bob, for joining us. Uh, Robert McKernan is the co-founder of Oasis Bird Observatory, and he is the ornithologist ornithologist slash biologist with OBO, as we call it. And before that, he was the director at the San Bernardino County Museum, where he spent more than 40 years as a museum director and curator of biological sciences. Um, and he's been conducting water bird research at the Salton Sea since 1979. And so it just has an incredible wealth of information and knowledge about the changes and the current status of birds at the Salton Sea. Um, with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here today. Uh, what I'm going to do is give a brief um, overview of results uh, from our studies uh, at uh, the north end of Salton Sea and central portion. Um, let's see if I can get my slides. Where, why isn't it moving? Uh, well, let me see. Apologies. 
Bob, Hang I'm on to the sharing, Bob, I'm sharing the screen, so just tell me when you want the next slide up. Oh, okay, next slide. Please. Uh, let me. Okay, can can everyone? Uh, I can't uh, shoot. Okay, there we go. Uh, just a quick refresher. Um, uh, just to give the audience an indication of the significance of uh, Salton Sea relative to the Pacific Flyway, uh, the Salton Sink, which uh, Salton Sea resides in, uh, it is a major migratory uh, corridor, both spring and fall. We've, we've documented that migration occurs over a broad front in Southern California, and uh, the Salton Sink, Coachella Valley, and San Gregorio Pass are significant in the sense that in spring you can have 300,000 birds in an evening pass through those corridors. Next slide. Uh, so what we've done is establish nine study sites around the central and north part of Salton Sea, including three off-site locations, uh, actually, actually four. Uh, we've, we've added one, uh, which uh, is along the Whitewater River. Um, and next slide. Uh, we've, we basically have put in about 400 days at the sea since 20, starting in middle part of 2014, and roughly about 4,000 hours. So uh, we've spent a lot of time at the sea. Um, our survey method is, is a basic shoreline method, uh, similar to what Audubon uh, uses, just a little bit of variation on that. Uh, we're typically on the east side in the morning from civil dawn till noon, and the remaining time on the eastern or western side of the sea. Next slide. So uh, there's been marked change that most folks have seen at the Salton Sea, but these two photos just indicate a 2005 view and a 2018, and you can see the receding shoreline from the receding water. Next slide. And, and in some areas, it's dramatic. Um, the northeast portion of the sea uh, in 2008 uh, versus September 2018 at, uh, at Hayes Drain shows the indication of uh, receding water. And then Salt Creek in the lower foot, uh, photos uh, indicates uh, a, a view, for the left hand, lower left hand is uh, looking north and then the uh, Salt Creek outfall, uh, which is uh, a semi-natural drain. Next slide. So um, receding water and the shallow bathymetry has played a role in creating these habitats. And it's absolutely amazing. Uh, it's, um, I, I was shocked being at Salton Sea since the 70s working and seeing what was happening just in uh, the course of two or three years uh, was amazing to me. Um, excluding um, salinity and the like, it's really creating some wonderful, wonderful habitat. Next slide. So, so the, the right-hand photo, uh, photos show uh, at the northwest side of the sea, a uh, receding uh, shoreline. You can see on boots on the ground where you can see the, the habitat created. And, and these, uh, again, have uh, created extensive wetlands around the north part of the Salton Sea. Next slide. And what's happened is the agricultural outflow drains, which these are in, in, in large part, are vital present day refugia. What's happening is uh, from, 20, uh, from 20 through 22, uh, we've seen birds basically congregate or these drains becoming a magnet. Um, and, and it's simply because of the brackish, brackish water and uh, pupfish and other fishes i.e. the, the uh, tilapia that are occurring uh, in these drains. Next slide. 
Um, so through these, looking at the drains, we've developed some hotspots and those hotspots pretty well overlay the drain um, uh, uh, landscapes on the northwest and northeast portion of the sea uh, and, and really are vital in the present day uh, biology of birds, both overwintering and migrant birds. Next slide. And uh, just a quick slide to show the number of taxa. There are 400 species or more that have occurred at the Salton Sea. But in, in these hotspots, we have 110 water birds that we've uh, recorded at the Northwest shoreline and roughly about 108 at the Northeast. Uh, shoreline, so it so it gives you a sense that um, these these drains are very important for present day uh, biology of birds at the sea. Next slide. Um, uh, this table don't pay too much attention, other than the pluses and the minuses. Um, similar to Audubon, we're seeing changes in relative abundance of American white pelican and brown pelican. Um, really, we started detecting this in like two. Uh, 2017, 2018, um, white pelicans are still around. However, they migrate through rather than staying long periods as in the 80s, they'd stay for uh, uh, seven to eight months. Now they stay for possibly a month or two uh, at most. Uh, brown pelicans, uh, similar in the post-breeding dispersal will only stay short periods. Uh, and eared grebes, I'll talk about Western grebes, Clark grebes only visit it uh, through during migration to a large part. And as Blake talked about, um, shorebirds seem to be, comparatively speaking, uh, fairly stable. Um, and snowy plovers are doing really well, from my perspective, based on our previous data. Next slide. So I wanted to give a, a quick sense. We and uh, we studied ear grebes in, in uh, for about ten years. Uh, Joe Gell and myself did aerial flights, um, and so uh, you can see that in the in the eighties, you know, there were two two and a half million birds that were sitting on the sea during during overwintering periods. And I will tell you that. Uh, it took us a while, like about a year, to understand how to count two and a half million birds on the sea. Photography plays a big role. Next slide. So now, present day, the temporal pattern is the same. Uh, this photo is a, is a shoreline from one of our shoreline sites showing peak movement of grebes uh, during spring, typically in March, early April. And they're moving into the Great Basin, Mono Lake, Great Salt Lake, uh, and uh, other areas beyond for breeding. Next slide. Uh, it, it, we've, um, we've had an opportunity to do two surveys via air, which is the only way to count grebes at the sea. Uh, and, and we did record about a half a million birds uh, and 19th of February, which is, uh, which is, remember, it's the spring passage period, really from February through early April is when the ear grebes start staging at the sea. Next slide. And this slide just shows you the spatial distribution. So Northwest and Central West really had the predominance of ear grebes. The reason why I show this is the photo. There's two methods, a shoreline method and an aerial method. The aerial method is really the way to understand ear grebe biology at the sea, because if you were standing on the shoreline right now, viewing out, you wouldn't see that mass of birds. And there's probably uh, 150,000 birds in that, that mass uh, that, that we recorded on the 19th of February. They, because of the sea's width, um, you can only see a kilometer or two out into the sea. So aerial uh, surveys to understand grebe biology is, and other species as well, is the prime method. Next slide. Um, now just, I'm gonna run through just a few um, 
uh, sorry for the brevity, but um, Western and Clark's Greaves used to overwinter in fairly large numbers. Even in the 80s, we recorded 20 to 30,000 birds on the sea. Now, granted, some of these birds could be sitting out in the center of the sea, but our shoreline counts give us a good index. And what's happening is you're having ear, or um, I'm sorry, Western Clark's Greaves moving through. You see them throughout the year, but in very low numbers. And the peak numbers tend to occur in spring um, in, in April, and they're there for only a short period. Next slide. Um, kind of one of, the, one of the real positives of doing our surveys is red knot, which is an Arctic shorebird nesting species that winters from Mexico to South America. Well, Salt and Sea is probably perhaps the largest um, staging area in the spring in California for red knots um, using the barnacle beaches. And, um, but as barnacles, which is, we're presuming their main uh, food habit, uh, food uh, resource uh, are starting to dwindle or uh, we're not certain how long this will hold, but um, uh, quite fascinating on red knots and uh, their occurrence at the sea. Next slide. Um, Caspian terns, a fish eating bird uh, that breeds in the, uh, uh, in the west. The, the, and um, it uh, overwinters, uh, it had overwintered at the Salton Sea in large numbers. Again, we're seeing you see on the, the graph at the right-hand side, 2018, well, those numbers are mirror 2021 20, and, uh, and now moving into winter 2022. 20, Next slide. Uh, white pelicans, uh, again, similar pattern. Uh, large numbers used to overwinter for eight, nine months. Uh, now uh, you'll, you'll see smaller numbers, a couple hundred. Um, but they're typically using fish farms on the peripheral offsite areas of the sea. And then uh, at night will um, uh, raft on the sea. Uh, but um, very little, you see very little foraging happening on the sea with white pelicans. Next slide. Um, Bob, just a time check. Hopefully you can wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Thank okay. you. Um, a brown, uh, brown pelican, a post-breeding wanderer, had, hadn't occurred at the Salton Sea since 1970. But um, again, it's narrowed its um, post-breeding occurrence at the sea, uh, does not overwinter in small numbers like it used to. Next slide. Um, herons, basically, uh, they, they, very few nest at the sea. They nest at offsite uh, areas, habitat, suitable habitat. Uh, Left-hand side, for example, the 82nd drain at the northwest part of the sea. Um, this is the typical pattern for uh, spring and summer for herons. And just to the north of this at a fish farm is probably one of the largest colonies in the Salton Sink, perhaps. Next slide. Um, and I, I didn't want to leave everyone uh, with just water birds. Uh, the Salton Sink is an important, viable corridor to, for uh, land bird migrants. And this just gives you an example. The 21st of April, uh, 2021, uh, at just in a six hour period, you record 1,295 Western kingbirds, a species that breeds uh, in the interior west, um, but it, it's, it, the Salton Sink is so viable or uh, so, so vital for uh, not only water birds, but um, uh, passerines as well. Next slide. And uh, lastly, I just wanted to leave everyone with uh, the point that food habits, uh, uh, prey changes are vital to understanding the ecology of bird occurrence at the sea. Obviously, the lower right-hand corners with uh, the Caspian terns eating tilapia is probably a thing of the past, at least from our perspective. So it's, it's vital that we understand that aspect. So um, next slide and uh, just uh, some of the summary I've talked about. Thank Great, you so thanks. much. Thank you, Bob. Um, your 
dedication to doing surveys for so many years and so many weeks is really admirable. And I want to thank you thank for you. all of your efforts. And next, last but not least, we'll go to Sam. Um, Sam is the environmental scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And she received her bachelor's degree in fisheries, wildlife and conservation biology from UC Davis in 2012. And she's worked on a variety of projects in Sacramento Valley, including working with green energy companies, ringneck pheasants, pheasants, sage grouse and nesting waterfowl. And with a passion for wetlands management, she joined the Salton Sea program as an avian biologist in 2016. And we're really happy to have her at the Salton Sea um, contributing great work and knowledge about the all the water birds and other birds that live around the Salton Sea region. And with that, thank, welcome Sam. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm Sam Prezaclaza, environmental scientist with CDFW. I'm going to talk a little bit today about the state's avian monitoring and ongoing projects. First, I wanted to start with uh, clearly defining um, how the CDFW Fish and Game Code defines the Salton Sea ecosystem, which is including but not limited to uh, the Salton Sea, the agricultural land surrounding the Salton Sea, and the tributaries and drains within the Imperial and Coachella, Va Coachella Valleys that deliver water to the Salton Sea. So it's a little bit more broad than just the shoreline by itself. And um, I think that's important to keep it in mind when we're dealing with uh, flying creatures. Okay, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about our partnerships and collaborations, our ongoing wildlife monitoring, and then our current salt and sea management program projects. So a little bit of our partnerships and collaborations that we have going. One of our main components of our salt and sea project right now, salt and sea program, is the monitoring and adaptive management program, which I think everybody that's been presenting today has been involved with. One main goal is to synthesize past and present monitoring efforts so that they can all be implemented towards future projects in an adaptive management process. So we're including information from people such as LA Natural History Museum, Oasis Bird Observatory, and others that have been talking today. Um, and then also we're filling in the gaps with collecting other information that's needed that may not be collected by um, other agencies. So also we're working with USGS and University of Idaho to monitor Ridgeways Rail and selenium impacts to those populations around the Southern Sea. Audubon, California has helped us doing the monthly surveys, which has been a great help to help us go and tackle some of these other issues that need to be um, dealt with as well. Also, we within CDFW are assisting with the Upland program by doing dove banding in the area. Here's a few examples of the birds getting their bling, both in the morning doves and the Ridgeways rail here. And the dove banding is important because it's the only area in the state where we're able to monitor white winged doves. And it's the largest area in the state where we're able to capture morning doves and that contributes to the statewide management of that population. So some of our monitoring that we're helping with specifically is the salt and sea fisheries, the avian usage in general, colonial nesting birds, marsh bird usage, dead and sick bird events, and then general changing habitat conditions around the sea. Some of these you've heard mentioned by some of our other partners here today. So the salt and sea fisheries, we mainly are monitoring that to understand how the sea is still providing for fish eating birds. It previously was monitored from 2003 to 2008 to understand the species composition. In 2008, they got to the point where it was clear that tilapia was the only persisting species in the sea. We reinstigated that effort in 2017 uh, shifting the points based on the shifting habitat conditions at the sea, but still doing the same surveys. And we found that the population of tilapia had dropped dramatically and continues to do so. We can no longer launch our airboats into the Salton Sea. So that monitoring effort has been 
discontinued for the time being. However, it was strongly paralleled by the evidence we saw when we monitor perseverous birds. And some of this was also shared by uh, Camilla earlier. These surveys from 2008 to 2016, monitoring perseverous birds via aerial surveys um, resulted in, you could see a dramatic drop around 2016. And that population is 2% of the historic averages of each of those species. We've not been able to, similarly, not been able to continue our aerial surveys from 2019 and beyond um, due to COVID issues in 2020 and beyond. And this information hasn't been supported by the on the ground surveys that there may be birds seen, but it's not rebounding to that level that was historically seen, unfortunately. So during our usage surveys and general monitoring around the sea, we've seen some pretty interesting and dramatic changes. Um, in this map on the right, you can see a red line of where we've previously traveled on the airboat in about 2016. Um, the blue line and these little, little rough marks on the dry playa there is where it is dry playa, dust suppression activities have been ongoing by the landowners. And these are areas where we've been been surveying on foot now. And so in this example on the left, there's perching posts where we um, were surveying and seeing pelicans using, you can see all the evidence on top, and the same posts just two, three years later with hundreds and hundreds of feet of dry playa behind it. You can see these um, nests from great blue herons that are clearly been abandoned. And that is something that we're seeing all over the sea. This has been really helpful that during our aerial surveys, we incidentally saw a lot of colonies being established in some of these off the shore, off the sea areas, such as the um, fishery at the north side of the lake. And this is a Raymer Lake. That's a CDFW owned site at the south side of Salton Sea, just less than 10 miles away. So here you can see we've clearly had an increase of great blue herons, great egrets, snowy egrets, cattle egrets, um, all establishing large nesting colonies. In addition to just a lot of loafing and foraging, white pelicans and brown pelicans. And just as of 2021, we had uh, nesting black skimmers and nesting terns. So we're still seeing changes every single year that's indicating that they're moving towards these other freshwater habitats. Um, another change that we've been seeing along the shoreline, as mentioned by Bob, also was um, an increase of marsh habitats occurring at the outflow of irrigation drainages. So this photo to the top is an area where an irrigation drain was outflowing onto dry playa and just creating a mud area. Just two years later, the same area is completely covered in emergent vegetation, over 200 acres of emergent vegetation that's now supporting a huge variety of, of um, avian species and mammals, some of which you can see here. You can see this nice um, successional habitat that's been occurring as this drain water comes and it even pushes the drain water further out, spreads it, and it grows even more uh, habitat. So here we have some sandhill cranes using the agricultural edge right, right in the vicinity. And then we've also seen them using these wetland habitats as well as a Ridgeways rail that's getting his telemetry meter to be tracked while in these marshes. In addition, another change that we've seen is uh, burrowing owl changing their range. We already have 70% of California's burrowing owl within Imperial Valley that's wintering here. Well, now they're using even more space. You look at this bottom area, you could see this little owl in the, <laughs> towards the center on the playa and they're making their burrows in these nice little depressions in the playa that you would hardly notice unless you walked over. So that's great news for the owl. Some of the other work that we do anecdotally or just um, incidentally while we're out is dead and sick bird events we might respond to, to pick up and, and help stem that event and also collecting water samples. Here's an example of just how different the water can appear from two different points around the sea. 
So although there's many challenges involved with our monitoring and planning of these projects, one hope is that we'll be able to or incorporate all the information that we're learning and that all of our partners are learning here so that we can make more informed projects that will help support a whole variety of species that are in the area. So I'd like to tell you quickly about some of our projects that the state is currently working on, starting with the main habitat project that's currently in process now. This is our species conservation habitat project, SCH. It's now 4,110 acres large. It's in process and construction, and it's due to be finished by the end of 2023. So the goal of this project is actually to construct um, habitat for pacivorous birds. Our goal is to make a productive invertebrate pay, prey base so that we can then support fish and then that can be our forage opportunities for pacivorous birds. In addition, we'll be creating loafing islands and nesting islands and you can see an opportunity of one of these already in construction here on the lower right. So this will create habitat from six inches to 10 feet deep. Although we're aiming to support pacivorous birds because they need the help immediately, we're already seeing a variety of birds using it. Um, everything is on the edge of the water, even just stopping by. I've seen more cormorants than I've seen in the last few years, so it's wonderful. Um, in addition to that SCH project, we have future projects that are going to be targeting dust suppression work and also future aquatic, aquatic habitat projects. So our dust suppression work is going to be focused on trying to mechanically roughen the surface to suppress dust from the wind, but also establish native vegetation. And that native vegetation will support forage opportunities for burrowing owl, for fly catchers, for Leconte's thrashers, for these other um, non-aquatic birds that we don't necessarily associate with the salt and sea, but definitely do require our help. So that's, that's an ancillary benefit that's associated with the dust suppression projects that will definitely be a boon for birds. In addition, the aquatic habitat seen in this left photo in all of the orange opportunities, and then seen here in this North Lake project on the right side, will be a mix of uh, shallow and mud flats, mid-depth water, and deep water projects to support a variety of, of bird species, as well as create more vegetated wetland projects in areas where vegetated wetlands are naturally establishing themselves. And that would help support waterfowl and more, <clears throat> it's just a different variety of migratory birds, including the sandhill cranes and the secretive marsh birds. So that is the end of my presentation. I just wanna thank everybody that helps us contribute information because I really hope that it all helps us provide further information to help steer our projects towards creating the best opportunities to support but as many of those 400 species that use this salt sea as possible. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sam. That was fantastic. Um, and we'll open it up for questions now. I'm going to scroll through the questions. I've answered some of them in chat, but I uh, just want to state, I think this the take home message from today is, yes, there are still birds at the Salton Sea and there's a lot of them. There's changes happening, but there are still birds. And there's hope on the horizon for some of the birds that are diminishing in numbers um, because of the, the work the state's doing to build new habitat projects. So hopefully you, you all heard that message as well. And um, I did wanna start with the first question from Leslie and it was, I think directed mostly at Blake, although anyone could probably answer this, um, but it was during his presentation. What, is it, what does the data mean um, in terms of what is going on in other geographic areas? Are the birds going elsewhere? Sure, that that is a <clears throat> that is a great question, and certainly one of um, one of the powers of the broad scale monitoring network that um, that is occurring across the Pacific Flyway, and and as far as really putting the sea into context, we're still actually struggling to do that in some ways, in part because of where where I mentioned in our incomplete surveys, so we have not taken the step of actually comparing directly comparing the sea to some of those other areas. We're hoping to do that over the next few years. And in that we do have 
we do have plans to expand the surveys to make sure that we're better able to cover the Salton Sea comprehensively. And we're also at the same time going to be redoing many of those historic surveys at these other important sites across the Intermountain West. So there will be actually this upcoming fall um, additional surveys throughout the Great Salt Lake. And we're hoping to start kicking off surveys again at the Salton Sea in the fall and this next, um, the next spring to be able to have that more direct comparison. So I think we'll have a much better answer in about three to five years. So sorry, that's, that's not, we don't have an answer immediately, but we would, we would though expect that if the Salton Sea is becoming, you know, more important to, to shorebird populations or less that, we, you know, that we would see changes in numbers in, in, in other locations. Great, thanks, Blake. And this next question I'll direct at Sam from Stephanie. Um, don't the agricultural drains carry toxins from pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers? I, yeah, so some of our habitat projects that we're building currently, or well, one that we're building currently, is specifically designed to not use drain water. And it's using um, specifically salt and seawater, high end salinity plus the new river water that's brackish and blending it with the goal of having a salinity that will reduce vegetation and have no vegetation and no uptake of some of these nutrients in there and have a salinity that will reduce the risk of, of these issues. As well as we'll have a adaptive management um, program in place for those managed habitats. So if there is a, um, an impact on the wildlife it can be identified, isolated, and um, retooled. But we are specifically designing the habitat with the aim of not using that drain water. And if we do, having a lot more investigations specifically regarding selenium and impacts on breeding birds with selenium before we are able to use that drain water. Okay, thanks. And uh, your, the next two questions are for you as well. Um, will there be a fish survey this year with Fish and Wildlife and CDFW? And then the second question is, do you use predator management to protect nesting tern and black skimmer colonies at the lake? So we do not currently have any predator, I'll start with that second one. We don't currently have any predator management strategies at the lake because we aren't managing the lake proper. However, at our properties where we are designing habitat and designing nesting islands, we are designing it with specific um, distances and depths of water as buffers between each island and between anything that could be used as a predator perching post or as a, a point for a predator to access those islands to prevent that from happening. Um, and that's what we're trying to implement on things that we're designing as nesting islands. Um, as far as the fish surveys, we currently are unable to access the lake and launch boats into the lake to conduct fishery surveys. So that is our main challenge at the moment. And we are trying to work through that by obtaining different equipment but at this point, it doesn't look like we'll be able to conduct a survey in the sea proper uh, this year. We are still conducting pupfish surveys and we do conduct the surveys in the drain. So we do get to see what fish populations are in the inputs to the Salton Sea. So that does provide us a little bit of information. And one, one of our hypotheses is that a lot of the tilapia in the Salton Sea, even if they aren't able to breed in the Salton Sea due to the high salinity, are coming from irrigation drains and flowing down into the Salton Sea where they're then available. So believe that that's why there's a small population persisting. And related to that, Sam, sorry, you're getting called on a lot here. Um, <laughs> but uh, in terms of the ag drains and the toxins that are in them from agriculture, are those getting put, it, toxins getting put into the birds since they are feeding in or near the drains? Do you have any data on that? Uh, we do not have any data specific to that. However, we've, it's been, selenium has been looked at more rigorously along the southern end because that's a known risk in other areas such as Kesterson that has alarmed people that we've been very careful about. That is the reason why um, we are creating that high salinity environment. However, 
Um, more research still needs to be done to really understand that system, all those, all those impacts, and that's something that we're addressing in our monitoring and adaptive management program, in our water quality, invertebrate sampling, and trying to include components where we can piece all this information together to really understand. We have limited water available to use in this area, unfortunately, and unfortunately, almost every single source is impaired. So we're trying to figure out what the best we can do for the birds is without causing them any harm. Okay, thanks, Sam, good to know. Um, there's a question on lithium. I can take a stab at answering this, but I'll, I think I'll call on Mike Cohen first to see if he wants to address this. And the question is about, if we're concerned about the planned lithium extraction and build out, um, is that concerning to us? And just as background for some of you that may not have heard, uh, there's a plan in place to extract lithium from geothermal plants at the south end of the sea. And the lithium is one of the elements needed in batteries for things like um, our, you know, the electric vehicles. And um, lithium can either be mined openly, but in the case of the salt and sea, um, they've discovered they can extract it from the, the brine water that comes out of the geothermal plants. And so there, there is a start of within the 11 existing geothermal plants of starting to figure out how to do that lithium extraction. Um, Mike, do you want to address this more? Um. So I, I guess one of the concerns with lithium is the land access and the footprint and competing land uses. So there's some uh, challenges around the Alamo River, which is the known geothermal resource area, uh, where uh, there's increasing development of geothermal plants with the eye towards additional uh, lithium recovery. Um, and that competition for land access uh, comes potentially comes at the expense of additional habitat projects. So earlier maps, uh, that the state showed for its 10-year plan included habitat projects at the mouth of the Alamo River in that region, and those seem to be disappearing. So that's a direct concern. Um, but what the specific uh, pollut pollutants or contaminants that may come out of those lithium recovery operations, I think that's still to be determined. Uh, and then once those plants are constructed, it may, they may prove to be compatible with habitat uh, once they're constructed. So I think there's a lot of questions that, have, that remain to be answered on that. Yeah, and Audubon, California, and our partners are looking to make sure that um, these plants and this extraction goes through a CEQA process, and CEQA is a California Environmental Quality Act, um, and that would look at um, any concerns around um, habitat or, or, or water quality or air quality. So um, we're ensuring that, that it will go through the pro proper permitting process and channels to investigate if there are any concerns around contamination. Um, it's still early enough in the process and um, to, to figure that out. And Frank Harris, our program director is on the Lithium Commission. And so this panel has been formed that is, is gonna be looking into these issues more in detail, um, but that's a great question. Um, I will go to this last question just to mix up the presenters. Um, Bob, have you seen a, a change in numbers of deceased or diseased birds um, in your shoreline surveys over the years? Uh, <clears throat> uh, no, not well, not recently. Um, obviously, um, uh, you know, the, the large die off of the ear grebes uh, that we detected in doing our surveys back in the 90s. But of recent, um, in 2016, 2017, we had some ruddy duck uh, and northern shoveler deaths on the northwest side, which I alerted um, uh, CDF of uh, California Fish and Wildlife as well as fish, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. But you, to answer your question, no. I mean, we've not seen the 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 numbers at, even even dating back uh, into the. Uh, 2000s, where we'd see, you know, you'd see half a dozen in a day. We have just have not detected uh, mortality uh, at the north and central portion of the sea. Okay, great. Sam, do you want to just talk um, a lot of questions about the new river and the blending of water and also the knowledge that, the, you know, there's water quality concerns in the new river? I think you've talked about a little bit, but could you just 
talk about the new river a little bit more and how we'll be addressing the contaminants that are in that river. So the, uh, the main strategy is blending the hyper saline water from the Salton Sea with the new river water and letting it settle out in a sedimentation basin and letting it, so at that point, anything from the river will settle out. And during our design process, there was a lot of discussion about when you mix it. Do you, do we mix it before or after the sedimentation basin? And that impacts the fallout and how it will be clean before it actually filters out and comes to our habitat pond. So that was something that's, that's been discussed in our design and in the CEQA process for many years that that would be the strategy to be used. And that's, um, that's how we're going to approach this first project with the knowledge that this is our first proof of concept adaptive management you know, a project that we're working on. So we'll be able to fine tune some aspects of this pond after we've mixed it be able to adjust the ratio slightly. We'll be able to adjust the residence time that will further affect the um, you know, fallout of materials. And then also um, be able to completely isolate cells and manage them if necessary. So if there is a need to remove accumulated vegetation because there's been an increased risk from a certain contaminant, then we have strategies to be able to isolate cells and manage and sort of reset them. And all of the lessons that we'll learn in this, this process will be applied for our next projects that will be taking place in a slightly different scenario at the Whitewater or at the Alamo, um, but we'll be using the same strategies to try and accomplish the same goals. Great, thanks, Sam. Um, does any of the panelists want to address any of the other questions or, or add in any or add in anything else? Okay, well, I think I got to everyone's questions in the chat. Um, so I think with that, we're, we're wrapping up. Um, let me just double check. Oh, there's a few more questions here. Um, there was a question about whether invertebrate surveys have been done in an effort to evaluate whether changes in food, food supply explain the seemingly increase in shorebirds. I think we answered that um, in Camila's presentation that we're seeing an abundance of um, water boatmen um, that are feeding shorebirds. And we also are looking to start a study if we can find the funding on biofilm and how shorebirds might be utilizing that. Um, Blake, is there anything else you wanted to say on that question? I think that you hit it there, Andrea, the, the data that, that um, your team at Audubon is, collect, is collecting at those survey points is, is the best available data, as far as um, as far as I know, on any changes in invertebrates. So the that then would go back to around 2016 or so. I think when those those surveys began. Great, thanks. And um, any any of you, do we see any ospreys at the Salton Sea? Say that again. Do uh, yeah. do you see any ospreys? Uh, I see them having uh, at the north. Uh, uh, at the north uh, portion of the sea during our surveys, um, we get anywhere from six to 12 in a winter. Um, and based on those uh, numbers, it, it's really hard to discern changes, although there seems to be fewer around. But um, yesterday doing a survey, uh, there was a there was an offspray at 84th, between 84th and 83rd Avenue that had a 10 inch long um, Mozambique tilapia that was eating it on a twig. So anyway, we have, we do have ospreys occurring in small numbers around the north uh, portion of our study sites, but we see them more at the fish farms than on the sea. 
uh, in the past year. Great, thanks. And I saw Sam nodding her head as well. And we've seen ospreys also, salt and sea. Um, next question is about visiting the sea and doing some birding. Tom, I don't know if you're still on the line, um, but we, Audubon, California on our website does have a birding trail map that you can print out that highlights all the, and Camila actually recently worked on that, um, that highlights all the places around the sea that are accessible still for, for bird watching. Um, we can also email you separately and, and offer a guide, one of the con contractors that we currently use at the Salton Sea. Um, so I will, Camila or I can put our email address in the chat and you can follow up with us directly. And then um, the, uh, and Camila, and this would be great for anyone, there's a link to a map for the birding sites around the sea. And um, the map is printable and available in Spanish and English. Um, we do need people for the Christmas bird count. Um, if anyone would like to volunteer for Audubon surveys or, um, or the Christmas bird count, um, we'll put an email address in the chat as well for that. Camila, maybe you can, you can put yours or Frank's email in there. And then lastly, Gary mentioned seeing more pelicans in a ranch in, in the Phoenix area over the last few, few years. Um, I think we've talked about the water quality of the Salton Sea, but um, in summary, we, we're hearing a lot of anecdotal information about white pelicans showing up in different spots, including at the golf courses at the north end of the sea. This could be because of what's going on at the Salton Sea, birds are moving around. We're also seeing a lot of changes in the Great Salt Lake that are causing birds like pelicans to shift. Um, hopefully that will stabilize and improve in the future, as Sam said, with the building of the new habitats at the South End. But certainly we don't have hard data, but anecdotally we have heard of white pelicans showing up in a lot of different lakes, even including man-made ones, um, looking for other sources of fresh fish. I think I got to everything. Anything I missed from the, do we use any of the data from eBird? Great question. Yes, we do, absolutely. Um, our habitat suitability model um, that we did in partnership with Point Blue was based almost completely on eBird data. And so, um, and we also use uh, the Christmas bird count data to track trends. Um, and a lot of the Christmas bird count data gets put into eBird. So if you are birding at the sea, please, please use eBird and put your data in because it it's, provides really valuable information um, that adds to all of the, the great work that this panel is doing. Uh, any other last minute thoughts from any of the panelists? Well, great. Well, thank you so much for all attending today during your lunch hour. And uh, thank you to the panelists for providing great information and, and continuing to keep everyone informed on the status of birds at the Salton Sea. Thanks everyone. Thanks Andrea for moderating this panel and for all the participants who've joined, we had a great turnout. Um, this webinar <laughs> has been recorded uh, and will be posted in the next few days up at the Pacific Institute website. Uh, and if people have specific topics they'd like to see addressed in future webinars, I'm hoping to do a series of these over the course of the year, uh, email me uh, with your suggestions. I've posted my email in the chat there. Thanks again, everyone. And we'll see you at the next webinar and at the Salton Sea Summit coming up the first week in April, April 5th through 7th, saltonseasummit.org. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.